Okay, so now we're about to begin. We have staying ahead of traffic, tracking a sewer design in advance of a highway expansion. So this morning we have joining us, we have Hunter Bennett Daggett. He has 17 years of experience in design permitting and construction of water and wastewater projects at Tetra Tech. We also have Wade Denny, He's a PE, holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Engineering and an MBA. And he's a licensed engineer working for the Utility Operations Department at Clean Water Services. Let's go ahead and give them welcome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you coming to our Wednesday morning presentation. We understand it's not always the most popular, but we appreciate you being here. So. As you heard, this presentation is staying ahead of traffic, fast tracking a sewer design in advance of highway expansion. This was a project where the actual infrastructure was pretty straightforward, but the coordination and the scheduling made it fairly complex and I think fairly interesting. So uh, as Andrew just mentioned, I'm Hunter Benedaggett. I'm a civil engineer with Tetra Tech. Oh, I need to advance this. I'll get used to it. And we also have Wade Denny, who's a principal engineer for Clean Water Services. Now, what we're gonna be covering today, we're gonna to start with some background on the project and on Clean Water Services. We're gonna talk about some of the agreements and the contracting that went into this project because they were, I would say, more important than is sometimes the case or more complicated and differently scheduled might be a better way to put it. Then we're gonna talk about the design of the pipes and the manholes. We're going to talk about the construction, which is underway as we speak. And then finally, we'll talk about some of the lessons that have been learned so far. Thanks, Hunter. So a little background here is always good to start out with. So the Clean Water Services of today was once known as the United Sewerage Agency of yesterday. USA was formed in 1970 through a special citizen election. The election was driven by the results of kind of poor water quality within the Tualatin River watershed. Um, the election basically was, was set to combine 16 sewer districts into one sewer district in order to optimize the treatment and conveyance system within that area. So once we were formed, we were able to begin the work to help, you know, the Twalden River watershed. Um, this picture to the right here is a picture of the Twalden River in the summertime. At the time USA was formed, it was really a polluted river that was being overutilized for agriculture and human consumption. Today, USA has been rebranded into Clean Water Services. Clean Water Services is really a watershed agency. We serve um, about 630,000 people within the Twalden River watershed. We operate over 800 miles of conveyance pipeline, 45 pump station, and four advanced wastewater treatment plants. We serve the cities of Beaverton, Hillsboro, Forest Grove, Banks, North Plains, Gaston, Cornelius, Tiger, King City, Twalden, Sherwood, and Durham. That's a mouthful. Our agency was one of the first agencies in the U.S. to obtain a watershed-based permit. This permit allows us to operate our watershed as a system and allows us to um, enact some interesting treatment trains to help uh, meet our water quality needs. This picture on the left is what the Tualatin River looks like today in the summertime, a lot more water flowing through there, a lot better water quality, and that's just a result of um, all the hard efforts and support of our ratepayers. So as a utility owner, at times we're faced to have to relocate our utilities. Um, it's never easy when we're asked to do that. And generally, you know, we're challenged, you know, especially with our tight budgets. We set our budgets, you know, prior to the year and we'll get asked to remove our utility during the mid-year. And that makes everything a little tighter. And kind of given everything else, we have current, you know, post-COVID staff shortage that we're all kind of facing right now. It's pretty challenging when you're asked to do something that's kind of outside your normal work path. And so it's important as a utility owner that you understand your rights. And, and as a utility owner, there's some federal laws that protect us and keep us um, protected. And it's pretty important that you understand that as a, as a utility owner. So federal law requires a process to be in place for the utilities when they're asked to relocate. ODOT has been very helpful through this process. They have a utility relocation manual, which is shown on the right on the screen. This manual provides you know, all the resources you need to really understand the process, understand your rights, 
and to know where you can you can begin to look at things to begin you know asking for different changes to the 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 process as a whole. So, for example, a couple of OARs that are very useful OAR. Um, the OAR 734-55, this is a really great uh, tool for everyone to know how to use here. Um, this is one that um, keeps us in check. It allows us to define who owns the utility and um, what type of utilities are reimbursable within the right-of-way. Another helpful one is the, is the um, federal law CRF uh, 23645. This is a real helpful law that helps us um, understand you know the provisions and the reimbursable cost within the right of way so in oregon the general process that's followed when we're asked to relocate a utility typically the the agency contacts you about the 30 percent design level if you're dealing with odot and at this level a conflict notice is sent out to the agency this conflict notice is usually accompanied by a reimbursement information form and this has kind of like starting the clock for the agency so now the owner must determine you know is there relocation reimbursable or isn't it? I suggest you know using this ODOT relocation manual, it's a great tool, it really helps you um, understand your rights, as I mentioned. And this is really a critical step for the agency. Spend your time to, to review what information you have to really define if your utility is reimbursable or not. And then if the agency does feel they're entitled to reimbursement, um, you'll need to return in, in the reimbursement information form to ODOT in a timely fashion. So following this step, ODOT will issue a construction agreement. This dictates the time of the relocation and the terms of that relocation. Now the clock is really ticking for the agency. At this point in time, um, you got a deadline and you got to meet that. So in our case, in March of 21, the district received a conflict letter that notified us of non-reimbursable relocation work within the right-of-way in association with a highway widening project. The project they are working on is their Highway 217 expansion project. One of the conflict sites proved to be very challenging and today we'll be discussing this in more detail. So a little background on the site here. So this, this site shown on the right here, next, that's right, um, was, the, was, a, was a simple site, you know, by all means, it was a really small footprint. So it didn't seem like it was gonna be much of a challenge. But what we had here was just this simple 30 foot deep two chambered vault with kind of unknown structural properties that was constructed sometime in the 1960s and we transported about 25,000 gallons of peak flow during a peak wet weather event. So the new highway plans were calling for another lane of traffic to be put in place over this lane. And this vault didn't, we didn't know the properties of this vault. So we weren't really comfortable with adding another traffic lane over the top of this, this, this vault with unknown structural properties. So we were able to reference some, some other projects in the, in the area and we found reference to this connection to the structure from another project from 1967. That's the detail shown on the left on the screen here. We know that this vault was originally historically configured to allow the district to measure flows coming in from Multnomah County by a partial flume. And over time, the need to measure flows in this manner went away due to changes to our wholesale operating agreement with the city of Portland, as well as modernization of flow monitoring equipment. And, and you know, over time, this vault kind of changed in configuration. There used to be access to both the north and south chamber. For some reason, the south chamber was concreted in and we weren't able to access that. So when we went to begin investigating this chamber, we weren't able to fully access it and really dive in to see what, it, what, what, what kind of condition it was in. So we had to make some general assumptions based on what we could see. So today this structure really is just a junction. It functions as a junction between the 60, 54, 18 and 36 inch gravity lines that all flow into this, this area here. Um, this site requires some special maintenance from our field operations crew, it requires annual maintenance. And the existing um, gravity lines all come into the structure really flat at flat grade. So these invert elevations really challenge this structure. So when it sees a little bit of a rainflow event, you see a lot of backwater in these upstream pipelines. And another factor too that we knew um, historically accessing this structure to maintain it off of 217 wasn't that great for our maintenance crews. And so that was another factor that we wanted to consider as we then begin to research this. Next slide. So this section of our system is really critical to the district. We reference this section of our system that this vault is located on as our Fano interceptor. This Fano interceptor flows north to south on the map shown on your right here. It serves a pretty large jurisdiction, but it serves you know, the cities of Beaverton, Portland and portions of unincorporated Multnomah and Washington County. 
the existing 54 inch interceptor really is the backbone of our, of our system here. And any negative impacts wouldn't be acceptable from construction. In addition, you know, any modifications to this configuration, we needed to result in better conditions than we see today, or at least equal conditions and equal or better reliability. And there were, you know, several large commercial dis water dischargers upstream, so we want to ensure they didn't have any impacts. So we needed to make sure we can continue to maintain flow from them during the course of this project. So when the need to investigate this vault for the future highway project came to be following our first notification, there were some immediate concerns that the district had, you know, regarding regarding the working within this area. Um, the, this section of, of, of our system, we spent a lot of time and, and effort working within. Um, the highway itself, you know, we knew was going to be a, a big issue and impact for construction, so we wanted to ensure we had a work, safe work site during construction. Another factor was Fano Creek. The district spent a lot of time and effort restoring the Fano Creek corridor, so we want to ensure very little impact to that corridor during construction. And we wanted to make sure that the new solution would exist successfully landlocked between the railroad right of way and the 217 right of way. And there were some nearby wetlands in the area that we wanted to avoid. And, and ultimately, we wanted to ensure that we had good communication over the course of this project with all, multiple jurisdictions as well as um, our co implementers. So, when we first received the conflict letter back in March of 2021, ODOT had identified CB, CWS of having to pay 100% of the re relocation. This placed a pretty large burden on the district, as you could expect. And we were forced to have to make this relocation by the end of June of 2022. So the district immediately began investigating the right of way ownership. We thought that it was worth our time to begin looking into the ownership and see if we had any easement tracks that predated any ownership of ODOT in this area. So we began soliciting the county and got some of these older easements that we didn't have copies of. And we found two, one from 1959, one from 60 that predated ODOT's ownership. So this changed the district's expense from a non-reimbursable to a reimbursable expense from ODOT. So in May of 21, the district sent our letter back to ODOT stating that we were entitled to reimbursement. And then we received a letter back from ODOT in end of May stating that we were entitled to reimbursement, but they weren't gonna allow us to add our project to their scope of their contract. So we had to work a little bit closely with them to try to get an extension of our construction date to actually work with the timeline we needed but we were only able to get about another, another month out of them for construction. So we were able to bump it up to have construction done by the end of August of 2022. So this left us just over a year to design, bid and construct this project. So in order to meet this tight deadline, the district you know, had to move pretty quickly to research, get all the permitting in place and construct the improvements. So the CWS operates under master service contracts. We established these contracts on a three-year basis with two years of extension. Um, TetraCheck at the time was working on their second task order for the evaluation of this structure. And so when, when we were moving forward with needing to advance the relocation of the services, we were able to bump forward with another task. We added task three to their, to their scope for the design and construction services of this project. So by 8-11-21, task three was executed and we're able to advance the project for the relocation. So this put us on a bid schedule that would meet the relocation deadline set by ODOT. Right, so Wade's been talking about this schedule already, but I'm just gonna put it on one slide here so you can all see it. In March of 2021, ODOT notified Clean Water Services of the conflicts at four different sites along their highway widening project. We're only talking about one of those sites today because the other three ended up being very minor. They were essentially uh, stormwater features being installed over existing pipe. So the focus ended up being on this particular site, the old metering vault. Um, in April, we did an initial review with Clean Water Services to develop some potential solutions at each of those sites. By June, we had a final conflict evaluation memo then in September, we were starting preliminary design for the work at the vault. And that original deadline had been June. So at one point, the hope was that we would advertise this in January of 22. We would open bids and work on contracting in February. So that was going to leave us with just a couple months to get this constructed and get out of the way of uh, ODOT's contractor, who was already going to be mobilizing on site. So you can see the, the pressure there. 
So just to look at some of the things we considered for that vault location. So as Wade already touched on, this is an old vault. We didn't have as-built drawings. It wasn't designed to be in a roadway. Uh, so we had to assume it wasn't designed for traffic loading. Even if it was, the videos we had from inside uh, showed that it was in pretty poor condition. There was a lot of corrosion. So we didn't have any faith in its ability to hold up to traffic loading. So all of our solutions were predicated on not relying on the existing vault. So the first option was to install a slab over it. The idea here was uh, the slab would end up being three feet under the surface of the road so that you'd have space for the, the road sub base. You wouldn't be installing the road directly on top of the slab, but the slab would take the traffic loading so that the vault underneath would not need to. It was going to be uh, pile supported piles driven around the outside of the existing vault. Uh, second option, pretty similar, but would basically put the slab directly on top of the existing vault. You'd cut the top of the vault off. Um, you'd pour a new slab that was not supported by the existing vault, but by the surrounding soil and or piles. Um, the benefit of this is that you could open up both of those chambers of the old vault. Uh, as Wade mentioned, it was you know, it's a very deep vault, 30 feet, and only one of the chambers had an access point. So uh, that was a benefit to that approach. Oops, you didn't see it advance, so that's all right. Um, the third option was to build a new vault around the existing vault. That would have been logistically complex, but it would have allowed us to keep the original vault and pipes in operation for most of the construction. So if you build the larger vault around the old vault, you demolish those walls and tie in the floor. And then finally, the fourth option was just to demolish the vault and replace it with manholes. Um, the benefits here are that you can really simplify the geometry. So ultimately, what we ended up going with was that fourth option, uh, demolishing the existing vault and replacing it with a large diameter manhole we were also gonna to need to put in some other manholes uh, along those three incoming pipes to intercept them so that we could redirect that geometry. As Wade mentioned, there's a 18, 36 and 54 inch line coming in. So the plan was we put uh, new manholes along those, along those lines, intercept them and bring them into a new manhole at the vault location. So this was gonna simplify the hydraulics. It was gonna greatly simplify maintenance access uh, another benefit here is that Clean Water Services is planning improvements to this Fano interceptor, the large diameter pipe, and uh, this section of it is about to get very difficult to access because there's going to be a new highway on top of it. So uh, it was definitely appealing to Clean Water to have this section just replaced, new pipes, new manholes. They can uh, use it as an access point for those future improvements rather than have to try and improve it then. The risks of this approach included a very tight schedule. I've already talked about that. And also the proximity to the railroad right of way. It's only about 15 feet away from the existing vault. So we were gonna be working very close into it. Um, in, these are a couple different uh, arrangements that we initially looked at. So here you can see existing highway 217 is along here on the top. These lines are the new lanes coming in. Uh, these red circles are proposed new manholes. Highlighted in yellow is piping and manholes that we would be able to demolish with a new arrangement. So the, the Fano Creek interceptor is coming along here uh, and then it turns and goes under the railroad, which is here. So this orange line you see there, that's the railroad right of way. The green is an easement that ODOT has from the railroad, but we did not think that the wording of that easement was gonna let it, us use it for sanitary construction. So we needed to stay out of, out of all of it. So as I mentioned, our initial ad work agreement was not approved by ODOT. Um, they cited concerns with just getting our project packaged with their package and bidding it out. They weren't willing to delay their bid schedule and that was understandable. But this pushed our design team into a really rapid pace of delivery to ensure this tight schedule was met. 
We had to work really closely to ensure that, you know, we were able to rapidly review and advance these plans. And as we we're in the depth of this ad aggressive uh, design schedule, ODOT bid out their project. Once they awarded their project, I got a call from their contractor, Kerr, uh, asking me if um, we could move up our schedule. And I updated him on the progress of our events thus far and where we were at and told him, you know, we really couldn't move up our schedule given that we still had to bid this out. We hadn't completed design yet and design was supposed to be wrapped up in February. So in January, early January of 2022, ODOT called me asking if we'd consider adding their work as a change order to their contract. I was, I was pretty happy to hear that and I was uh, pretty, pretty, pretty excited and we were able to have a few internal discussions and then had some discussions with our design team here and ultimately felt that this change made a lot of sense. And so we were able to um, advance our project as part of their project through a change order process. And this made the district really feel that the overall flow of the project is gonna be much better controlled knowing that um, the overall Highway 217 widening project prime contractor is gonna con control the pace of the construction of the sanitary relocation piece. And so this, Change order was approved by ODOT, and we were able to get it all approved as a lump sum item for the reloc relocation of our sanitary sewer. So now I'm going to talk a little about the preliminary design initially. So in the preliminary design, we were mostly looking at some of the challenges we had here, especially given the tight schedule. So the first of those was depth. The existing manholes and pipes are largely at about 30 feet of depth. Uh, one of the lines coming in, the 36 inch line is higher and then has a drop structure coming into the existing vault, but we didn't want to include a drop structure. So basically all of the new pipes and manholes are gonna be around 30 feet deep at that depth. Uh, trench boxes don't cut it. So we were gonna need sheet piles um, or something comparable. And uh, given the proximity to Fano Creek, at this depth, we knew there was going to be a lot of dewatering required. Originally, we were assuming we'd have to be installing this in March and April. So high groundwater, lots of water to pull out of that, out of that excavation. Um, second, there's a lot of flow to bypass. Once we were looking at demolishing that vault, there was gonna be at least some bypassing required. You can see in the table here, uh, some of the modeling information that Clean Water Services had looking at peak flow during a, a five-year storm. Um, most of the flow is coming down that 54-inch Fano interceptor, but there's substantial flow from the 36 and 18-inch lines as well, combining at around 22,000 gallons per minute. So that meant uh, any bypass system was going to need to be pretty large in size and robust because the modeling indicates they get these flows on a regular basis and not always in connection with an obvious storm event. So uh, they needed to be ready and they needed to have redundant systems. In addition, we wanted to make sure that this was useful for maintenance. And that means uh, safe access for clean water services crews. Um, accessing a manhole in a road is always a little complicated. I put a photo here that's you know, an access to a manhole all set up. This looks like it's in a residential subdivision or business park, something like that. We're along a highway here. It's, uh, it's sort of a side highway. It's, this is not a widened lane of Highway 217. It's a collector distributor road that's getting built in parallel, but it's still gonna be a busy two lane road. Um, so we wanna make sure it's as safe as possible to access these new manholes. And when you're trying to maximize safety, every, every inch counts. If you can rotate that manhole to get the cover further into the shoulder, that's definitely beneficial because that means a simpler traffic control setup, less disturbance to traffic, and most importantly, greater safety for the crew that's going into that manhole, or even just looking into it or putting equipment into it. Um, and also, as you would imagine, the uh, stakeholder coordination was also very important. ODOT was the biggest stakeholder, as you'd imagine. They're the ones kicking all this off and the ones building a new road on top of the existing infrastructure. We were working with them from the very start. The city of Beaverton was also important. However, that 18-inch pipe coming in is theirs. Uh, 
They originally had two manholes adjacent to the vault that were going to be demolished and removed. They also have permitting authority over this area. So we needed to be working with them to keep the project moving. And from the beginning of the project, we were meeting with them and ODOT uh, every other week just to provide updates and make sure that everyone could, could help as best they could. And the final potential stakeholder is the Southern Pacific Railroad. This is a busy railroad because there's a commuter line that comes across there. Um, our past experience indicates that working with railroads to get access to their right of way is not a speedy process. Uh, we didn't think we could do it in the time we had. So the goal ended up being just staying out of their way, not doing any work in their right of way. So once we moved to final design, uh, we were looking at materials, how to build this. Uh, you can see the amount of pipe is pretty small only 70 feet of 36 inch PVC pipe, 20 feet of 60 inch. Uh, we went to PVC right away because that's what uh, Clean Water Services standardizes on. Um, for the manholes, we've got a variety of sizes. The original intent was that the three manholes getting installed on the active lines were all gonna be doghouse manholes where you put a precast structure over the existing pipe, you form up a cast in place base around that and then you cut open that pipe. And then the new manhole at the location of the existing vault was going to be a conventional precast base, precast barrel manhole. And then we were going to need a temporary manhole on top of the uh, 60 inch pipe downstream of the existing vault. Ordinarily, the purpose of that was for bypass discharge. Ordinarily, you just discharge to the next manhole downstream, but that's on the other side of the railroad tracks. So that wasn't an option for us. So the plan was to uh, pour a block of concrete basically around the existing pipe and use that to support a uh, 48 inch manhole barrel that we'd set on top of there, cut a hole in that existing pipe. And then once the work was done, we'd just um, put a flat top on top of that uh, manhole barrel section. So this is the arrangement we ended up with and it's, it's pretty much all designed around um, simplifying the flow and also simplifying the bypass. So the green arrows you can see here are the, um, the new flow directions. The four blue circles that are numbered are the new manholes and then this fifth manhole is the temporary. And this red line represents what we had envisioned for the bypass. You're able to, basically you're, you're picking up the 36 inch line here. You're redirecting that flow over to the new manhole on top of the 18 inch line. You bring both of those down to a new manhole on top of the 54 inch line. And now you've combined all your flow into one. It goes into this, this new manhole where the vault was, this is the vault structure. And then it's uh, redirected to go under the railroad tracks. So we were trying to just have one suction point, one discharge point for the bypass. Now for maintenance access, uh, these purple lines you can see here are the two new lanes. So for manholes three and four, we were able to rotate them and position them such that the, the covers are gonna be in the shoulder. Uh, up on the other side of the new road, manholes one and two were actually further out of the shoulder, far enough that we are concerned about access uh, for another reason, because this is intended to be sort of a low point between the two, the existing road and the new road. So uh, it was going to be sort of a stormwater swale. So we were concerned about crews having to sort of skitter down this slope to uh, get at these manholes. So we added a two foot high retaining wall to create a platform. The idea being that a crew could come in here, park their truck and access these manholes. So construction on the project was originally planned to occur from June of 22 through the beginning of August of 2022 to meet our August 31st, 22 construction date. With the inclusion of the district's project within the greater ODOT widening project, um, the schedule shifted to better work with the needs of their prime contractor. The advanced schedule is shown here on the bottom and currently scheduled uh, construction is underway um, with the pre-construction meeting that we conducted on 7-5-22, which kicked off the construction phase of the project. 
And then as of the end of August, we were able to wrap up all the, the submittals for review. And as of last week, the contractors mobilized the site, installed their dewatering equipment, um, installed their erosion sediment control, uh, set up their bypass pumps, tested their pumps, and also began excavating for their first of their two uh, temporary bypass manholes. Their current construction schedule shows them continuing construction through September with everything wrapping up kind of in mid-October. So working within ODOT's larger project has resulted in a high degree of advanced communication with ODOT to ensure that we don't have any miscommunication during the course of the project. One of those critical areas is related to our inspection process. On this project, ODOT is taking the lead on the overall project inspection, but they have chosen to take on inspection aspects that, that overlap with the footprint of our project. For example, the erosion sediment control, ODOT's taking the lead on that piece of the project, even though it's overlapping within the footprint of our area. While the district is leading the, the inspection on the sanitary sewer infrastructure that's installed. So if, 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 if issues arise on this project, the district will lead through any project related matters directly related to the sewer installation and then work with ODOT if there's any change orders that need to happen in order to resolve the, the, the issues that we ran into. And ODOT will lead any contractual issues with the prime contractor as well as overall site compliance and per permit condition compliance as well. So given that the, um, the district sanitary reliant project was absorbed within ODOT's project, the paperwork has been streamlined for the district. Essentially the district is tracking our internal costs and we'll be submitting for reimbursement on those internal costs post-project. ODOT's leading the pay application process. The district reviews those pay applications, review the percent complete for the billing period, and then approves that. And then ODOT issues the, the, the pay application or the, the, the pay request for payment to the contractor. Um, in the event of a change order, for example, ODOT would work with the district to determine the validity of the change order and then issue the change order and then they would pay out the change order just to, over the course of their normal monthly billing. All right, so as is usually the case, the contractor had some modifications they wanted to make once they were on board. The biggest of those was they changed the bypass approach pretty dramatically. We had focused everything on getting down to one bypass system. They broke it back out into three. Uh, to do that, they needed to install two new suction manholes, uh, temporary suction manholes. They were able to use an existing manhole that's sort of over here on the 54 inch line. And then each of those will have its own bypass system coming to the temporary discharge manhole. Um, the benefit to that more complicated arrangement is they can work on the dry on in the dry on all of those new manholes. They don't have to do uh, doghouse manholes for any of those four big new manholes. They can do all of those as fully precast. And at one point they were also proposing to swap out the PVC pipe for the uh, Hobas fiberglass reinforced polymer mortar pipe. As far as we can tell, that was just due to availability. This was early in 2022 because it looked to us like that was gonna be more expensive for them but they were ultimately able to procure the PVC. So that was a change that went away. So now I'll just show some photos of construction. No, I won't. Now I will. Okay, you can see here the pipe that's been delivered. You can also see how close Highway 217 is. It's right there, heavy traffic coming by. Um, this is Emory and Sons, big new excavator that they brought in for this that has a 30 foot excavation depth. Here you can see the uh, dewatering setup. Dewatering was a lot simpler because they're doing this in August and September now. Uh, they sunk four wells around the perimeter and they're pumping out of those, but groundwater's a lot lower than we anticipated because of those extra months. Here you can see the, uh, the bypass systems getting set up. These are the new temporary suction manholes getting installed. This is the suction manhole on the 36 inch line. And uh, here they're getting ready to install the one on the 18 inch line. So we always like to kind of wrap up things with lessons learned on these projects. Um, you know, one of the big lessons was just early communication. We really had to spend a lot of time communicating to understand the timelines and to communicate those timelines with, with our partners as well as, as, as the consultants that we're working with. 
And, you know, know your easements. If you don't know them, spend the time to get to know them. When you do find them, save them to a place where you can access them in the future. They're super critical. If the district didn't do that, we would have been on the hook for 100% of these costs. And work with the contractor to refine means and methods when you get the opportunity. You don't always get that as an engineer, but when you do, spend time to do that. They always can value engineer your projects, and they always have a different way of going about things as an engineer. So, you know, typically contractor and engineer don't always see things the same way. But that can kind of hold true and, and in this project it did and, and we were able to refine some means and methods to better advance the project for the for the contractor itself. And that wraps up everything we had today any questions we've got a few minutes for questions, I think. About five minutes. Uh, what was the base bid by Kerr for the ODOT widening and then what was the change order amount uh, that was rolled in for CWS. You know, I don't have their base bid um, amount, but I do have the change order amount. So the change order is $1.8 million for this change directive. It's a lot for, you know, 90 feet of pipe. There's a lot of highway work going on out there. So while I don't know what exactly the price is, it's years of highway work. So substantial, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, those will be buried below grade. So we'll essentially abandon them below grade, um, leaving kind of an underground structure. Yeah, it'll be the same as that original um, discharge manhole. We didn't want to try and remove it. We figured it might damage the pipe. And this way, if there is a need for something similar in future, we could potentially use that same point. Uh, is there any value in telemetry control or SCADA control on those improvements with those types of flows on those trunk lines? Is there anything for monitoring as far as potential surcharging? Or is there hot spots that are up or downstream of those trunk sewers? Yeah, good question. Uh, we do have a monitors that are telemetered in, in, in line with this system right now. So we have one just upstream of this, this section. We had to remove that for this project. Now we'll go back in post project. We'll be able to maintain flows because this this section of our system does surcharge at times, and we do want to watch those. Did ODOT provide review and approval? They did. Yeah, they did complete review and approval for the manual relocations, and as well as just the overall you know progression of our of our work. Yeah, we didn't ultimately. Our drawings were just appended as part of the change order, but they did review all those drawings and they had comments and revisions. All right. Well, thank you very much.